and welcome to Frankly Speaking, the podcast that gains access to real and inspiring people. Today, our guest is Madeline Back, and I'm going to be showing you her book that she wrote a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Um, she's an author, she's a speaker, she's a sexual violence activist, she's a former psychotherapist, uh, and hosts her own podcast, Unbroken, and, and we'll clearly speak more about that uh, in the next few minutes. Before I do speak to Madeline, I'd like to make a few announcements. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsor, House of HHH, uh, which spreading the message that helping to make our communities home. Some uh, plenty of exciting ideas um, are being suggested by uh, House of HHH, and uh, we want to be part of that process. Um, I want to thank those who continue to follow, frankly speaking. We clearly would like more subscribers. We'd like people to like the podcast uh, and leave comments. We, and we don't say that for us. We say that for the guests because they give their time freely uh, and they, they share their experiences. Uh, and uh, they've all been very inspiring. So if you could support them, we'd appreciate it. Uh, we'd also like to let you know that it's not only uh, YouTube that you can uh, watch or listen to the, uh, the interviews or the conversations. Uh, we're also accessible via Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes and Podbean. As usual, we'd like to acknowledge um, the Alzheimer's Society, the, all the fantastic work they do both for sufferers and their families. We continue to support Change Your Life Put down your knife, and uh, I've still got the T-shirt. Uh, they're doing some fa fantastic work, and uh, we, we clearly support that. We do, we do not want to see young people killing each other or, or, or going to prison. Uh, the, the one we've recently been supporting is Casual Minds Matter, uh, which deals with men's mental health, which is appropriate because I believe May is, is, is the month for um, um, mental health uh, issues so uh, and I think our next interview will be with somebody that's that, that suffers with that and has also written a book last but not least we want to thank Mac the Hat uh, Gary for all his uh, technical support and advice but the main person today is Madeline so uh, we'd like to welcome Madeline Madeline welcome to Frankly Speaking Thank you, Frank. It's lovely to be here with you. I'm, uh, I'm going to level with the, uh, the viewers or listeners uh, straight away. I read this book, uh, Unbroken, by our guest today, Madeline. And I read the first half of the book, which I found particularly harrowing. Uh, it brought out certainly a deep sense of anger in me. Um, and then it got to the second half of the book, uh, and that made me even more angry, um, partly because what's, what's taking place, the account was taking place in the book, uh, and, and the fact that Madeline had to do that, had to find the strength to be able to do that, to make it as... Uh, as informative as she possibly could. Uh, and I say, I don't normally show people's books uh, until further into the, to the conversation, but I, I needed to do that because to be quite perfectly honest, I, I think if I'd have read the book and asked Madeline to come on, um, I don't think I'd have been in a, in a particularly fit state to do it, if I'm, if I'm honest. Uh, but I've read it again. I have read it again. Uh, I suppose I braced myself. I knew what was coming, um, and uh, I think, as you'll as you'll find during the course of this conversation, to be able to do that, to be able to to uh, to write this book, and more to the point, to be able to go on uh, and do something about it is uh, is, is admirable. So uh, I'm going to thank you again, Madeline, straight away. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I can't believe you've read it. <laughs> it's over to you. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> a bit calmer. I'm certainly a lot calmer this time. Um, and I think it's partly because I know you're, do you're, you're doing so well. I think it's the fact that you, you show that strength and, you know, that you carry on and you inspire so many people. So 
it's kind of calmed me down a little bit, to be honest. And, and that's what I tell people, you know, it, it isn't an easy read. There's some chapters no. that aren't very hard, but I say, you know, look at me now. I'm I'm really yep. okay. And I I couldn't write it if I wasn't okay. I couldn't do everything that I do if I wasn't no. in a really healed place. Mm. So it was very therapeutic writing it, but it, I also wrote it from a very healed place as well. Yes, yes. Well, what I normally do is I ask, I mean, clearly I know some of the answers because I've read the book, but not everybody does, and hopefully they will purchase the book at some stage. Um, so I know you grew up in Hendon. I do. So I'm a North London girl, but I now live in Bonnie, Scotland. I've lived here, oh, 29 years. Wow. Which part of Scotland? I live in Glasgow. Oh, um, right. Oh, blimey. Scottish well, child and two Scottish, uh, one English child and two Scottish children I have. <laughs> Or let's hope England never plays Scotland in the football. That could get a bit lively. <laughs> right. So you growing up in Hendon, uh, presumably you went to school in Hendon. Were you, were you a good pupil? Were you a studious uh, student? Yeah, I was just really uh, just a, a bit of a shy young girl, I think quite naive in the world. And up until this mm. happened, yeah, I was very keen on doing my best as I could at school, you know, to please your parents and to be a good mm -hmm. student. But obviously, um, I experienced a huge trauma at 13 and then that changed everything. That wasn't, mm -hmm. school wasn't my focus then. Mm -hmm. I, do you want to explain in your own words um, what that trauma was? Yeah, I'm perfectly happy to do that. So, I guess really I did something that most young people would have done at some point in their life is that I went out on a night out and I lied about where I was staying. But the consequences for me were catastrophic because I got very drunk for the first time in my life and two young men took me back to my friend's mum's empty flat because we had lied about where we were staying. We weren't meant to buy alcohol, we weren't meant to be with boys and to cut a long story short, two of them raped and tortured me for four to five hours over that evening and then just mm -hmm. left me in the flat. I think the way I think the way you've just um, described that is about as short yeah. <laughs> as you as as you could. Um, and again, I, I I encourage people to buy this book because they really do need to, to understand the brutality. And that's, that's not a word I've used very often, uh, but we are talking brutality, we are talking brutality. I yeah, mean, it's interesting, you know, when I came to write it, um, I was encouraged by a teacher that I've been going to many years, as you've read it, you'll know, it's a man named Imaho, and he asked me to write my story down. And I said, mm. no way, because I was so filled with shame. But he asked me and asked me, and it took me, four years and I wrote 12 pages and he said just put all the details everything that happened don't leave anything out and my friend who then went on to become my editor Joe he read those 12 pages and he said you are going to put the details in the book and I said oh no way Joe you know I can't mm. put that in because I'd be too ashamed and I don't know what people will think and then he kind of you know worked on me and he said listen as a man he never really understood what a woman can go through if they are raped he didn't he just thought you'd be mm. overpowered and it would be forced sex, but he didn't realise, as you call it, the brutality or the degradation or the mm -hmm. humiliation or the attempts to take my life. He said it's very important that you include it all in. So by the time I got my contract with my publishers, they said, listen, we don't think we can put that in. I said, no, no, you, you have to put that in. I'm not going to now write it to kind of sugarcoat it and make it easy for people to read. So we came up with a compromise and that's why there is a yeah. trigger warning when you get to the chapter which is called all of one night so I, then I do put all the details in but I think you know if you pick up a book and it's about a young girl who's been raped by two men you know there's going to be some talk of rape in the book it shouldn't really be a surprise yeah. but it was an interesting process for me you know not wanting any detail and to think and actually if I'm going to do this I have to be honest I have to really say as it was which i did it, it's quite did. ironic because i was listening to um uh, nick ferrari on lbc this morning and one of the subjects he was talking about was uh, cambridge university mm -hmm. where they were saying that people 
needed Shakespeare. They were talking about Shakespeare uh, and some of the students saying that there needs to be some kind of warning about how graphic um, Shakespeare can be. Um, and of course, there was a variety of people that phoned in and said, oh, for Christ's sake, like, you know, there's so many horrible things going on in the world. Uh, you know, are you really not that prepared? I mean, yes, you, if you suffer with something, I can understand if you've experienced something, uh, maybe some kind of warning, I, I, you know, I, I kind of grasp that. But I thought of, I actually did think about the book, your book, and, and I thought, well, how much explanation would you have to put yeah. you know on the bookshelf or on the book itself i know i you always know. think well i never got a trigger warning when it happened to me you know no exactly um, that's what one of the that's exactly what one of the people that phoned in and said look you know how do you prepare for a b and c and they gave they gave various examples and 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 i, I i've never phoned in to a radio show i've been interviewed on the radio but i've never actually phoned in and I came really close, I came really, really close to saying, well, I've, you know, I've read a certain book, you know, and, uh, and uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the person involved in the book uh, certainly didn't get any warning, you know. So we, we've all got to kind of um, prepare for life, you know, unfortunately. And surely, you know, you see, you see subjects on soaps, you know, whichever soap that you might watch. I mean, they've pretty much covered they do. Every it's, subject. It's really, it is a representation of life because just yeah. because it's a soap, there shouldn't not be domestic abuse or hate crimes or no. racism no. or knife crimes. You know, it, it, we should show these things because it, it takes place somewhere every day, doesn't it? Well, I find it very strange that, you know, I'm not sure what age you get to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, but I like the thought by the time you got there, you'd have some life experience you know, or you've witnessed it, you've seen it in a film, you've read it in a book. Uh, I don't know, I didn't know, I didn't know what to make of it anyway. What, one of the things that, um, that does, you know, strike me when I've read the book is that you, you didn't actually get any justice, did you? It depends what you mean by justice. Yes, um, justice in one sense could be them being locked up, but my justice, as you know, my best revenge, mm was about living my life and not letting them yeah. destroy me and sadly we know now i mean rape is really decriminalized especially in scotland it's like of all cases that make it to court hardly i mean it's such a small percentage that will end in a conviction mm. so you know would i really want to put myself through the trauma of a court case be re-traumatized be re-triggered yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't need that justice, is what you know, people mm. need justice to be able to. Move. Maybe I shouldn't have put, maybe I shouldn't have said um, whether you require justice. What I should have said is that they escaped justice because uh, mm. they certainly escaped. I mean, saying that again, you, you know, some people may say, well, uh, maybe that's still on their conscience, you know, that, that, that's something they've got to live with. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I came to a decision that when, as you know, I came to a place of forgiveness that actually I've done a really, really good job of cleaning up my life, cleaning up the trauma and living, you know, my life as well as I could. But I thought they have to live with what they did to someone else. And I can't imagine that's easy. And even if they're not consciously aware, it's going to impact on their life. They may be a drinker or, or something, you know, they're going to yeah. they'll carry that in their systems, whether they're aware of it, you know, consciously, it's, it's part of them. Uh, well, know. I wonder how they, I wonder how, I mean, what, what, how old were they? Uh, they were maybe like 17 or 18, they would like... I wasn't sure if it was 16, yeah. 17, 17, 18. Uh, I mean, what happens, you know, when they, and this isn't trying to give them any mitigated circumstances, I can assure you, um, but uh, I wonder what it's like when they go to in, into what most of us would class as a normal relationship, you know, a loving relationship uh, yeah. and family. How, how do they interact? How do they interact with a female knowing that they've done that or dread the thing? And all of it is guesswork, really, isn't it? Because we'll never yeah. know. And, is, yeah. and I used to do a lot of guesswork. Oh, I wonder what happened. Listen, what about that? And now psh, I can't do that because I drive myself crazy. Yeah. yeah. So I had to stop all the questioning and all the wondering because some questions I'll never get the answer to. So. No.
there's no point because it's it's not healthy for my mind. I need my mind to be calmer. And if I start going into question mode, then I, I just start spinning, <laughs> you know, because there's no answers. No, just to just to just to explain to people the pressure that you were under. If I've got, I hope I've got this right. Didn't you actually come across them again? Uh, I when I was um, I took the bus one day in Golders Green. I was going home and I saw one of them. All right. Uh, one of them that had the longer hair, and I, I literally peed myself. I was terrified. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, you know, so scared. He didn't actually see me, but he sent oh. a message to one of my friends who was his next door neighbor to let them to tell me that I owed him money for the taxi that took me back to the empty flat. So they just what, thought that was okay how they treated me, and I should just pay for the taxi. Uh, yeah, I don't know how they justified any of that in my mind but that kind of do you know what that is that is just that is just triggered off something that is just triggered off something in my mind i've recently been doing some research for for a project i hope to be working on sometime in the future mm -hmm. and it brought up a case of the, i don't know if you remember this they were called the railway rapists uh, and railway murderers mm -hmm. Uh, they, they tended to use railway stations as a base for their victims. And um, it was all around West Hempstead, Hempstead. Some of it was a bit further afield. And it was a fellow called John Duffy mm -hmm. and, and uh, David uh, Mulcahy. And there, there, there was an incident, one of, the first, one of the first cases. And after either raping or sexually ass assaulting a girl, they they passed her in their car and one of them joked to the other that oh should we stop and give her a lift yeah you know because how so there's a sick so there's clearly a sickness there and for, and for the suggestion that you know they wanted money off of you uh -huh. for the taxi well, what i came to understand my own understanding is how can you be connected to yourself if you can dehumanize a person like they did to me when they were dehumanizing me they're only dehumanizing themselves they weren't connected to them their selves in any way they were totally out of their body totally out of their mind as well they were doing a lot of drugs and drinking so they weren't connected in in any way which is justify anything if we're not connected to our source our, our goodness our light whatever you want to call it so yeah when you're out of your body, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of your connections. You when they're doing that to someone else, they're really just doing that to themselves. That's how little they think of themselves if they can treat another person. Well, like well I'm hoping not to not to, to minimize or you know diminish your situation. Um, you know, the fact that you've mentioned drugs and drink and so on. Uh, you know, I, I just hope that that wasn't something in their nature. Um, well, and, that they, and that they went on to do it to do something similar again in the future. You know. Drugs and drink do not cause rape. Hundred percent. No, that's power in it. No, that's, that's, you know, uh, uh, people that are stone cold sober will assault women, men as well. Yeah, yeah, that's fair comment. People that yeah, take drugs comment. will also do that. People say, yeah. you know, um, domestic abuse only happens because of alcohol. And you think, well, why doesn't he abuse everyone else in the pub? Why does he wait till he gets home yeah. and abuses yeah. you? So yeah. you know, we have to be careful when we. Yeah, I agree. People like that um, because it wasn't anything to do with my clothing or the alcohol that I drank at 13 it, it came down to the fact that these two men decided to rape me and that was it nothing to mm. do with me after the, the months after that I mean did you did you go back to school uh, yeah my I just kind of really um, lost it big time obviously as you would with a massive mm. trauma so I kind of stopped speaking i kind of stopped eating i was filled with self-loathing i hated myself i didn't really understand what had happened and i couldn't verbalize it i was also threatened just before the very end and they said you know if i spoke about it that they would come back and find me and one of them had held his knife against my throat and he had used the knife on me already and i believe them so it, that silenced me as well also my guilt for lying and being with boys and you know not being where i was meant to be staying that night kept me quiet but i know really that if we can't speak about it your body it's got to come out somehow so i developed anorexia i had depression i started to drink and use drugs just to really 
numb out so that I wouldn't feel, so that I wouldn't think about it. And I just became so, so down. I just thought the only way out was just to end my life, to not be here. And I ended up taking mm -hmm. an overdose, which landed me in a children's psychiatric hospital, part of Great Ormond Street, where I would spend a good few months there, but um, didn't really improve. I put on a bit more weight, so they let me go home, but I was yep. still just rebelling. I, I think, I thought, looking back, I think if I just behaved really badly, then people would understand that something must be wrong. They'd be able to guess, jump into my mind, but I couldn't physically, you know, get the words out. It was, it was too much for me. Mm. And then, so employment, were you able to, were you, were you able to seek out employment? Were you allowed, as you got older, were you allowed, you know, were, were you well, capable of you you know, using it's, it's, skills you'd acquired? It's amazing the mask that we can put on and just, you know, kind of like separate those many different parts of me. See, I trained a long time ago as a beauty therapist and I went to college when I came back from a year away and then I worked in salons for years. I wasn't very comfortable working on men, obviously, but uh, mm. most of my clients were female, so that was great. I worked as a makeup artist and then I moved to Glasgow and I always wanted to work within women's rights and I started my Scottish life, work life, I suppose. I worked for Women's Aid, women that experienced domestic abuse, mainly as a volunteer to start with, and then there was funding. So I ended up doing with them for about 14 years, was a volunteer with Rape Crisis, and then I trained as a therapist and became a psychotherapist. So I did that for many years. And then just before lockdown, I thought, great idea. I'm going to focus on speaking now because I started to share my story and speak more and more. Yep. And then the pandemic came and the work that I had just evaporated. So uh, that plan didn't go too well, but slowly. The <laughs> well, <people> yeah. <laughs> and you. you're, um, you're very proactive in the PSA now, the Professional Speaking Association. Yeah, so that, that's really where we both know each other. So yeah. I'm in PSA Scotland. I joined, it must be like three or four years ago. So I'm on the committee there as well. It's the Professional Speaking Association. And really because of them, my first international gig was in Johannesburg. I went to speak at PSA South Africa, which was right. fantastic. And then the uh, same week I went to the Maldives to speak for UNICEF. So that was my first two international, that one was a paid one, that was good. <laughs> so that was the first time I really had spoken overseas. So it was brilliant. And just before lockdown, I was the closing keynote, which most people, if you're the starter or the closer, it's like one of the nicest yeah. to be given as a speaker in Namibia at a global speaker summit in February and then Brilliant. March went into lockdown. So I thought, oh, my career's taken off. And then, boom, <laughs> it kind of changed direction. But hey, yeah. that's life. But, but your podcast, your own yes. podcast. So my podcast really was, I guess, the gift of lockdown because I thought, what am I going to do? Yeah. I was one of these people that thought, it'll be fine we'll just wait a few weeks we'll lock down and then you know we'll all be back to normal and then I didn't want to buy a green screen I've got a green screen sitting there I didn't want to get all the fancy technology I just, right behind me I've got mine behind know, me it just terrified me and I just thought oh I can't do all the online talks and everything and then eventually I had to give in but with the podcast I just thought it was so depressing in the first lockdown there was so much fear for people and it was like a collective fear and also I think for people that had trauma that was never processed a lot of that was coming up because they couldn't really avoid themselves and we're good at humans at avoiding ourselves you know we distract ourselves in the day or the night so a lot of people sat with unprocessed trauma so as we know there was a lot of mental health issues going around and I just thought I wanted to share some hope or some positivity and I'm very lucky, I know amazing people. So I've worked with the Forgiveness Project, I'm one of their stories. And I'm also involved with an organization called the Global Resilience Project. She has taken 50 people like me that have kind of overcome adversity, pretty much like my podcast show, and they've kind of bounced forward. And she yeah. looked at what we all do and she's written nine secrets to thriving. So in my podcast show, I speak to people that have overcome adversity and they are thriving and they're making a difference to other people mm. so it is called unbroken healing through storytelling because I, like you i just really believe in the power of sharing our stories mm. of where the ripples can go and and the effect it can have and, and the impact it can have for other people so 
that's really why we do it. Well, even myself, I've, you know, I've, I've spoken to people now, uh, before now, and uh, sometimes it happens during our conversation. Um, I'll suddenly identify with something. And, it, and I, I start questioning myself. And I have to be careful not to... to, to I always <laughs> almost become the person asking the questions and the person giving the answers. I have to remind myself, hold on, this is the guest. You know, this is their, this is their platform. Uh, so yeah, so I'm learning how powerful how powerful that can be. Uh, I, I think you've heard of a lady, uh, Jo Berry. I know Jo very well. Jo, yeah. she is uh, from the Forgiveness Project, so I know. Jo. Yeah, I, knew, I, I, I figured you'd probably know her. And uh, I interviewed Jo, mm. and uh, there was a, there was a lot of crossover between you know the subject. And um, yeah, it was almost like she was she was interviewing me because um, she knew partly some of my past, you know. And um, and I, I understand that she's going to be at the uh, the Global Speakers Summit. It is. I think she's on the main stage because when I've looked, when I've bought my ticket to go, it's in Dublin. Oh. And, uh, I've noticed that she's one of the speakers, so I'll be really pleased to hear her speak. She, I won't give too much. I won't give too much away in there because, yeah, you're, yes, you're you're right. She is going to be uh, one of the speakers, um, and uh, I'm also going. I will be going, so I won't let you into too much yet. But I will be. I will be making a contribution, shall we say? Good. Um, and uh, my wife's coming, so I'll be able to introduce you to my wife okay. here. My guardian angel <laughs> keeps me out of trouble. Keeps yeah, me out of trouble. I'm leaving mine at home. <laughs> yeah, after so, so uh, yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. I am looking. I am looking forward to that uh, again. Alan Stevens, you know, meeting you know, meeting Alan Stevens. In fact, we've got a we've got a London meeting on the 14th of May, uh, and that will be the first open meeting I've been to. The, there's been one other in London, and I'm very much looking forward to that and meeting up with. Uh, some of the people there have you know, very welcoming. They made me very welcome. Uh, I clearly kept in touch via, you know, um, virtually. But clearly it's not the same, is it? It's not the same. You can't really convey yourself. It's, uh... Oh, no, it's so exciting now to be back in the room. We, Scotland, haven't quite got back into the room just yet. Right, OK. Venue, but I think next month. Do you, do you have it just in Glasgow or do you have it in different cities or towns? Do you take turns? Glasgow to Edinburgh, so they do a yeah. turn about. Oh, that's good. That's good. I, uh, I I met some of the f f uh, people from Scotland uh, one night when it was a virtual one. I don't think I'm not even sure whether it was the Scottish meeting. I think it might have been actually. It was because you were doing a spotlight, but I think I wasn't there. Ah, uh, oh, don't don't remind me. Um, I, I think the most terrifying thing is when you do the um, speaker factor. Mm. I can't believe five minutes can be so so tense. Mm. You know. Uh, I think anything after after speaker factor, I, I wouldn't have a problem with. I, was I didn't speak, uh, Madeline. I didn't speak for the first few, few, I think about a minute or so. And my wife and uh, my oldest daughter were in the passageway and they couldn't work out what was going on. They thought something had gone wrong with the laptop. And I had to count under my breath. I had to literally say, you're going to blow this. You know, and I had to literally go one, two, three, and then bang. And it, the, the good news is it was the good thing was it's quite an impactful first few lines. So it looked like I'd done it on purpose. But as you know, the PSA's motto is speak more, speak better. Yeah. So the more you do it and the more you yeah, speak yeah, yeah. in the audience, it does get easier. Definitely. Mm. So what is, what is your status in it now in Scotland? In 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 the in the in the, uh, the Scottish branch, are you not the chairperson there? No, no, no. I just... oh, I've, oh, I must have elevated you there. Sorry, perhaps oh, it's... that's very nice, but no. Perhaps you're on your way. Perhaps... I'm in the best position I really want right now. I've got a lot going on in my own life, so I, yeah, I don't think I'll be able to commit. I to do that. wonder how they do it. To be quite honest, some of them, the amount of uh, the amount of work and the amount of effort they put into it yeah. is uh, yeah, it's, it's 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 a good thing. So, what about um? So what have you? What are you currently doing? I mean, obviously you're still doing your your, your, your podcast. My podcast um, this week is episode eighty nine, I think. Wow, it's, it's quite amazing. I've just 
done it weekly and it's we're now in i think 90 countries and uh that's always amazing how it just travels around so you know what i i really um i kind of just trust life and i just let life bring stuff to me so slowly more and more speaking mm -hmm. events coming in i will always speak out about sexual violence i think to the day mm. i die because it took me so long to find my voice but i really want to just be able to i guess share my story to end the shame and the stigma and the yeah. silence for other people so i do that I, last week i did a book event which was very exciting a live one in newcastle with my friend and i was the interviewer for a change rather than being interviewed oh. she is a uh, a fiction writer but she's just written her own memoir so it was really really good to interview her her name is louise beach and the book is daffodils it's just on audio but it's it's also about a difficult childhood and how he's mm. overcome it so it was yeah really good we talked about this for years and like this is happening so that was exciting so yeah slowly more things are coming in so do you think you'll write any more books do you is it something you want to do no um you know when i when i decided to write my memoir the words literally just all flew in and in about eight weeks it was done it was like automatic writing and now i think i use my words but i use them when i speak i use them in another way so i have quite a big social media presence and i'm always um yeah you know posting just to encourage people and to show people that don't give up there's always hope you know we can get past anything if we truly work at it with the right support and the right help find your voice speak out share your truth because when we don't speak out it holds us back it really does um so yeah I, I will always have a social media presence but i don't know about another book i'm, I'm not sure but never say never you know we'll wait and see well not not necessarily well not necessarily on even on that so do you like did you well maybe you didn't maybe you didn't enjoy writing that book so much um but it is it would, would writing be something you would enjoy doing you know when i wrote it it really felt like it, I was automatic writing. I just made that decision and then literally the words yeah, yeah, yeah. appeared. So I think when you're ready to write, then write. And it was very powerful to me to put it all down on paper. And then I didn't intend it to be a book. I just wanted to write it for me to put it all down. And then I thought, oh, this is kind of like a book now. Mm. You know, it's like 70,000 words. So I then obviously went to find a publisher and I got it published. So and I think if people can't find their voice, then writing something down is also really it's a powerful way to release that energy that you've yeah. held inside of you. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually. Well, I'm only halfway through the second one because the because the first one ended at sort of around about 1996. Um, so of course I've lived another life. Yeah. Since then, and 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 half the book would be probably still entrenched in the first book mm -hmm. uh, but i'm really glad i didn't complete it yes. because so many other things have happened since that, that would have been missed and i couldn't imagine writing the third one blimey um oh well, you never know but, um but yeah I, i'm glad it's 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 come to and of course it's more reflective isn't it it's more reflective of the first one yeah, because yeah, when you wrote the first people. one you'd be in a very different place to yeah. where you are at now yeah. you're in a very different place again yeah so you've got your podcast you've got your podcast coming up yep. um 90 i can't believe it. i think i'm only on 30. <laughs> i've also got 10 in advance in my bank so i i interview maybe oh, one or two a week so just to keep the, the stockpile going so to speak so i'm always ahead of myself i've always yeah 10 yeah. edited episodes to put up so they'll just go out weekly well, Madeline, we always say, you know, we want, um, you know, we want real and inspiring guests to come on to Frankly Speaking, and uh, you, you've certainly been that today, and I really do appreciate it, and uh, and I'd like to thank you for the book, mm -hmm. not 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 for not for writing the book, not in case of providing the book. I mean, writing the book, you know, because um, it opened my eyes. Yeah, it, it, it opened my eyes because you it's it's so you know rape's only a four letter word you know when you read it when you read this book you think oh, it doesn't describe it does it that, that, those four those four letters do not describe uh, and you know. but sadly is the the truth of it is that my story is just the story of many 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 women and men and mm. children on this planet you know every day somebody will be sexually yep. abused raped yep. whatever 
So my story is just a story of many, you know. Um, sadly, mm. it's not an uncommon story, even though no. the first time you've read something so shocking, it's not about comparison in any way, but really, mm. I love it was just that one night. I, I never lived with an abusive partner, that it was constant, but I know my story of sexual violence is not uncommon at all. No. If you can just stay with us for a couple of minutes, and um, I just, unless, unless you've got anything else to say, Madeline, you're, you're more than welcome if there's um, anything you want to... Um... I always like to end by saying, you know, to anyone that's been listening and maybe they've been um, triggered in some way or they've been touched by what we're talking about, it's just to remember that it's never too late to find your voice. You know, there's always... Yeah. Oh, there's yeah. my dog going. <laughs> there's always help out there. Um, it's never too late to go and get support. No, that's that's fantastic. And don't worry about your dog, because me and Gary used them off budget. So <laughs> I thought I heard a little birdie in the It's just a different. <laughs> we, we like to show real life. And I thought, is that a little chirp chirp of a budget? Yeah, it's, that's that's Buddy the budget. It's oh. all right. He's, 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 I think he's been in it. He's been in the last few uh, podcasts. Oh yeah, I just say, oh, there's my co-host. He's not, get, he's not getting he's not getting paid. I can assure you. Okay, then I'll just make these announcements a second. Just to have us a couple of minutes afterwards, and we can say our goodbyes properly. So, so again. Once again, man, thanks for coming on and uh, say sharing your your experiences and and your knowledge, you know, and uh, and, and your inspiration to people. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. So we do appreciate you coming on. Uh, again, I'd like to thank all those who follow. Frankly speaking, again, please, you know, support us and support the, the future guests that are coming on because uh, that, that that also inspires people to come on and uh, and share their experiences, and that's what we want them to do. Uh, thanks to, to our sponsor, HHH, House of HHH, I should say, to give it proper title, uh, doing their best to inspire communities to, you know, take the initiative and build their own support groups and uh, and look after their own and look after their own communities. Um, uh, also, again, wanted to mention the Alzheimer Society and Change Your Life, Put Down Your Knife. And, uh, and Casual Lives Matter. And again, thanks to Gary from Matt and the Hat Media. Um, by the time he got yourself a pet, um, but we'll, we'll discuss that afterwards. Uh, but again, the main person today has, has been Madeline, and, uh, and we thank her, we sincerely thank her for coming on and speaking with us today. So, Madeline, we wish you all the best. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. You're welcome.